Okay, so we're talking about relating to your audience. Um, now remember, we're, we're not talking about selling out. We're not talking about compromising the truth of the Bible, of, of God, of, of Jesus being the only way to salvation. We're not talking about any of those things, okay? We're talking about removing what has come between telling about the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are things that are dismissed as, well, it's okay to have these idols in my life because they're religious. And we assume that these religious preferences are equal to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I would argue that they're actually not only ruining your effectiveness, um, but also, um, sorry, I just remembered something. They're not only ruining your effectiveness, but they're also coming between the message of Jesus. We're not choosing between loving God and, 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 and whatever. Loving God means obeying God, and obeying God means loving people. So I hear people say this all the time, oh, well, I love the Bible. I, I, I love truth. I, I love God. I just don't really like people. Well, then something hasn't made a connect. You love knowledge, not God, because if you love God, you would feed his sheep. And the problem with that is the problem with loving knowledge more than anything is that it becomes nothing more than a search for knowledge. So we're talking about loving people, not traditions, not politics, not suits, not hymns. Um, it becomes very common that the older we become, the more stubborn we become about stupid stuff. Stupid stuff. Like I'll give you a good example. Every year around October 30th, there historically, there were different pagan uh, celebrations, non-Christian, uh, heathen, whatever you want to say. And these would be harvest festivals. Well, so the Christians kind of commandeered that holiday, and they made it into what is... What they, what they gave the name to Halloween. Nowadays, fast forward hundreds of years, all of a sudden, Halloween is now evil, and we have to call our little community events that we do on Halloween Harvest Fest. Does that make sense to you? We're calling it what the blanket sweep of a pagan thing is instead of using the Christian word that Christians invented, Halloween? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> like... What? <laughs> I'm not telling you to go out and worship Satan. I'm saying we're making a huge deal about calling it Harvest Fest. Don't call it Halloween, even though Halloween is a Christian word and Harvest Fest isn't. What? Yeah, see what I mean? Stupid stuff like that. Things that are coming between us and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We think that the only thing that comes as a barrier between the message of Jesus is immoral living. Um, you know, uh, doing drugs. But there's a lot of things that we as Christians do that, that also builds up a wall and makes it where people are less likely to listen to us. And you might say, well, I'm not here to please people. If, pe if they hated Jesus, they'll hate us. And I, I, I get that. Really, I do. I have had so much stuff happen since I, since I was a pastor that I totally understand that verse and I totally stand by it. But here's the thing. Sometimes we make, we make it hard to believe, hard to accept. For instance, we use words that don't mean anything to them. We do Walmart evangelism where we yell at people about how they're going to hell. How does that tell them and tell the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, you can't have good news without bad news. I, I, I understand what you're what you're trying to say, but Proverbs also says to make wisdom acceptable. So what we're doing is we're saying, no, I don't have to make wisdom acceptable. I can go and say it however hateful, however rude, however off topic, however whatever as possible. And it's not my fault that they reject me. It's their fault that they reject the message. Because even though I've done nothing to make this message acceptable, nothing to help them to understand the message, it's still all their fault. Yeah, that's not self-righteous at all. No, really, I think that when you stand before God, he'll say, you know what, it's okay that you were self-righteous and prideful because you were telling them like, like it is. We need we need preachers who still preach that hell is hot. Yes, I'm not saying that hell went anywhere. I'm, what? But there's better ways of telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus could have wasted his time talking about destruction by just killing people randomly. 
he could have proved his point better by coming in judgment and, and all this stuff, but that's not how he came. He came humbly, and then he died. The only person who didn't deserve to die was the only person who did die for all of us. That just blows my mind. See, the problem is that we start to love our traditions. Well, we wear our Sunday best. A recent tradition, not associated with the Bible or truth or Jesus. We sing hymns here. Yeah, hymns that most of the words don't really mean anything to anyone. Well, we talk about, you know, I, I, preach, the, I preach the gospel here. Well, it kind of sounded like you were preaching politics and have about how your political party is somehow the option. No, no, not right now. Uh, your political option, uh, option is somehow the only option. Uh, it sounded like you were teaching your traditions about organs, about, you know, NASA-looking carpet, outdated paint. Uh, you know, it, that's what it seemed like. It didn't seem like we're actually interested in, you know, truth. So I left off with this last week, and, I, and this is exactly where we're going to pick right back up. Do you cater to people who have never had a chance to hear about God, or do you cater to people who don't care enough to let their idols go? And you might say, well, uh, th that's not fair. No, it, it is exactly fair. You are going to focus in your ministry. You're going to focus on one or the other. You're either going to be focused on keeping, trying to pacify disgruntled Christians, or you're going to focus on witnessing to people. You will only have enough time and energy and effort for one of these things. One master will win it all. Either you will be focused on maintaining the building, cleaning toilets, uh, re resolving internal conflicts, people gossiping against each other, or you will be focused on being badmouthed in the community, being betrayed, dealing with, dealing, having, to, having to get Christians who should know better on back on topic about spreading the news about Jesus Christ rather than, well, I come every Sunday and I've given, faith, uh, given tithes faithfully, therefore I should be allowed to act like this. Well, no, that's not acting like a Christian. The, the, the fruit of the Spirit working in your life is patience and kindness and goodness and those things. Oh, of which there is no law against those things. But what we do is we get together and we get our holier-than-thou parties on and we get our prideful attitude going and we gossip and we complain and we whine about the druggies and this and how they're ruining our community. And then we start talking about politics and how the Democrats are ruining – or I'm sorry, Democrats are ruining everything and how if we, they have to be stopped and uh, conspiracies and all these different things. It's like, wow. And so that – is what it means to not muddy the gospel? Because that sounds like you're muddying the gospel with politics and with your own personal preferences and opinions rather than teaching Jesus. Trump is not going to save America. Jesus is going to save souls. That's how that works. But what has happened is we've gotten into a very awkward place where we are elevating pol certain political parties and people to the place of Jesus. And we are elevating traditions to the place of Jesus. And then and then we complain about, about Catholics. Oh, those Catholics, they're this and this. And then we do the exact same thing. Don't think just because we don't have idols in our auditorium or our sanctuary that somehow that means that we don't have idols. Because what happens is we have literally Christians who have been saved for 30 years that still will not let go of their idols. Oh, well, they, it's not really an idol. I tell you what. Take out your pews. Don't ask anybody's opinion. Take out the pews and put chairs in their place. Let's see whether that, which by the way has nothing to do with the message of Jesus Christ, let's see if taking out those pews causes a problem or not. And I think you know exactly what the answer is going to be. Let's say you, st you, you stop doing hymns in total. You write your own songs. Okay, Now listen to me on this. Write your own songs that have just as much scriptural truth as hymns do, and by the way, not all hymns are biblically based. There's a lot of hymns out there that just have a lot of made-up doctrines and stuff, so keep that in mind. You write your own, so it won't be even be an issue of the truthfulness of the hymn. Okay? Then set it to an organ. Buy yourself an organ, play your song that you wrote on that organ, so the style this is the same, the truth is the same, and watch how much people freak out, because it's not the hymns that they like. It's not what they grew up with. It's not their preferences. Now, taking these things, get it down off your high horse and realize that, no, we are not relating to our audience very well. We have created a club, a country club, where you come here and, and we just make fun of those stupid sinners. That's what it's become.
You, you can you can cloak it however you want it. You can make it seem as, as holy and pure as you want, but at the end of the day, that's what it is. And it's us not willing to let go of our idols. When something comes before God, when something keeps you from loving people, that's an idol. And don't think that God is at all pleased by these things, because he's not. If you are more scared of the nominal attender getting upset, okay, than you are reaching people, you've already compromised your mission, you've already compromised your morals, you have already lived a compromised life and can no longer call yourself a Christian leader. Because it's not about God or his kingdom, it is about your kingdom, your traditions, your values. And if and if Jesus is not a Republican, then that's not Jesus. See what I mean? It, it's become sabotaged. The mission of Jesus Christ is no longer Jesus Christ. And not only that, but oftentimes we try to add works to our, to our salvation, which I think I kind of already cleared on that, so we'll just keep going forward. Here's the thing that you have to realize. Now, don't try to offend people. Try to try to bring peace. Say things wisely. Say things at the right time. Uh, you know th those kinds of things. But someone will always be offended. You will either offend a church person because you aren't a museum for the saints, or you will offend an unchurched person who doesn't know Jesus because you are not known by your love. Would you rather offend someone because you're doing the right thing or because you're doing the wrong thing? Because you're maintaining mediocrity? Sit. Because you're maintaining mediocrity or because you are trying to tell people about Jesus? Now, the problem is, is that we won't talk about this seriously because we're the pastor. We just know. God has spoken to me. I have special revelation. I can do stupid things and it's okay. I'm a pastor too. That, that's nonsense. If you're not getting anybody else's opinion, you're the only person who has all the answers. Everybody else is wrong. Everybody else is an idiot. You're wrong, and you need to think about some, a, a different tactic. And you're not gonna you're not gonna grow as a church. You're going to spend the rest of your years uh, taking care of your dying congregation, and eventually the church will shut down. Maybe you'll live to see it. Maybe you won't. Well, at least we didn't compromise on truth. No, no, you compromised on truth. At least you didn't compromise on your prideful, nasty attitude. That's what you mean to say. What we don't understand is why keep the church in the 50s just because you grew up there? Why keep the church in the 90s just because you grew up there? Why keep the church in the 80s just because you... It doesn't matter where you grew up. That was fun then. That's how it, what got maybe that's what got you saved. That's what church was like back then. It was a different world back then. Now we live in a different world. You don't have to keep doing church the way that they did in the fifties. Oh well, we wear suits and ties. Oh well, do you now? Why? People who work in offices don't even wear suits and ties anymore. What what are you trying to prove? Well, we take our hats off when we enter this building out of respect. Yeah, the priests wore, ha wore head coverings. People go into their jobs wearing head coverings. Like, it's not a thing of respect anymore unless you serve in the military. And even then, it's mostly the older people. You don't have to agree with me. That's just the way it is. You can spend your time trying to prove a point, or you can spend your tri time trying to tell what God wanted you to and called you to do. Stop getting sidetracked on stupid wool crap. Why keep the church in the 50s just because you grew up there? It's hard to let things go. That's the way I liked it. That's the way it was. Yeah, I get that. I really do. Sometimes I'm walking down the pews, and I th or not pews, church seats. I'm walking down the aisles, and I'm just thinking, oh, I just wish sometimes I could go back. Things were simpler. We didn't have to worry about reaching out to people. We didn't have to worry about, you know, that druggie bringing his kids in and them writing on the walls. We didn't have to worry about those kinds of stupid stuff. I mean, the church always looked great on the inside. Um, we we never we never we never put out of our, our put out of our schedules. We never had to had to work on loving people. It was just about routines and traditions. It was really super easy. Um, you know, and, and I could just go into the church and just have a good time just being by myself. Well, things have changed now. <laughs>
does every mole molehill have to be a mountain? Does every single time that you see something you don't like, does it have to be a big issue? My my son was doing this thing where he his sister did something he didn't like, so he hit her. And I said, well, why'd you hit her? And he said, be because I didn't like what she was doing. I said, well, do you think that she liked you hitting? And he said, no. And I said, well... Just because you don't like somebody doing something doesn't mean it has to be, you know, something that you fight about. Go do something else. And I feel like that's a lot of what's happened in the church. We we try and find that perfect hometown church, the church that we used to have. You know, the the if you find a church that's stuck in the past, that's not a good thing. And you know, people always say this. Oh well, you know, this church they actually love people, they actually reach people, and then they get there and they want it to change. They want it to go back to being. A country club. And the problem is not every molehill deserves to be a mountain. Sometimes there's going to be disagreements and you just, it's okay. Sometimes people are going to disagree with you leading as a pastor and you just, okay, it's all right. It's not the end of the world. So I was watching this um, this web webinar. I, I don't know these newfangled terms, <laughs> whatever. This video with leaders I don't I don't know man whatever and there was this guy Martin uh, van Tilburg I believe was his name and he said he, he was he was talking and he, he made this statement he said is there a, is there what are we doing excuse me why are we doing it is there a better way to do it so ask yourself that is there a more efficient way are we doing this well or are we just simply following the same protocol that we've been doing for years just because this is how we've been doing it well we know that it's the right way to do it because this is how we're doing it um okay that's an idea are you bringing people to god or to your traditions well we have to make sure that we only witness to republicans they have to make sure to convert to republicanism before they can enter the church. It's like, um, what? What? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that God wants us to reach people where they are. I'm pretty sure he wants us to reach out to drug dealers and drug addicts and republicans and democrats and black and white and everything in between. And when, when you start picking that apart, God, I hate the rich. I hate the poor. I hate the black. I hate the white. I hate the, see what I mean? And now we've started putting this like limits on God, I don't want you to save everybody. And I don't love everybody. I mean, maybe these people. So are we bringing people to God or are we bringing them to our traditions, to our way of doing things, our culture? Is there a more efficient way to do what we're doing? These are questions you should be asking. Every leader should be asking this. Are you impacting people or are you appeasing Preferences. Are you impacting people? Now remember, God changes the person, but he uses us. So are we impacting people? Are our lives being changed? Is God, is God doing something in our church? Or are we doing the same thing every single week? Man, I really, that was a good hymn that we did, that we did today. Let's do it again next week. Are you just appeasing preferences? Well, we can't do that because then this person will get mad. We can't do this because then that person will... You will either do the mission of God or you will do the mission of people. You can't have it both ways. You can't serve multiple multiple people. It's just never going to work because God will be offended. God will be offended if you pick people over him and people will be offended if you pick God over them. The church will be offended if you try and reach out to people. The world will be offended if you don't try to reach out to them. I mean, nobody's going to be offended. So do you want to offend? I mean, nobody's everybody's going to be and get offended from something. So do you want to accidentally offend people because you were doing the right thing? Or do you want to accident, um, ac purposely offend people because you weren't doing the right thing? We can't be all about appeasing preferences. That can't be the, the reason why we exist. It can't be. That's not good enough. And what I'm saying is this. Methods change, but the message doesn't. The message is Jesus Christ is the way to salvation. Him and him alone. The methods change. Are you using the wrong method for your audience? Sometimes we want to try and talk to kids, but we want to use models from 70 years ago. And you might say, well, okay, what is that? Well, let's let's 
let's look at this. A me a me the message is, an example of this would be, Jesus is the way to heaven. A method would be something like Sunday school, the songs that you sing, uh, your sermon, or if you don't do sermons in your church, I'm not sure what you would substitute with that, but I mean, there's some churches that are really trying some new things, so okay, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, a suit can be a method of sharing Jesus. Now, in today's audience, the suit really isn't a method of sharing Jesus Christ anymore. It's not. It used to be, but it really isn't. Sunday school, I mean, it used to, it had a very unique historical purpose, and now, in some places, it has become kind of like a service before a service. For some people, it's a discipleship program that they just still call Sunday school. Um, for some, you know, there's a lot of different reasons. Uh, and, you know, if it works in your area, that's great. If it does what it's supposed to be doing, that's fine. Uh, whatever. It, it's wh whatever. I'm not trying to say you have to do things like I'm doing, like I want you to do things. I'm trying to tell you not every method is, is going to live on, and that's okay. You're going to have to think of new things, get rid of old things. It, sometimes things just need to change. Okay, whenever I have a problem with this, I always think of this. Who invented the model of the temple for Israel? Now remember, temples were in use long before Israel was, was a nation. Uh, there were laws were given supposedly from gods long before uh, long before Moses got the law. That wasn't anything uh, new or groundbreaking. The, the whole three-part sanctuary, you know, the outer courts and the inner courts and all those, that, that, that was, we have, we can compare that to other tabernacles that existed from other religions. God used what people knew, okay? But who was the one who told Israel to use that method? Well, God did. He, the culture had a method. God took it and adapted it for his people. Now, why did he use a method that was already, already in existence so that they could learn about him and who he was and that they could tell others about who he was? But then who was it who got rid of Israel's temple? Well, it was God. God did away with his own method in exchange for a newer method. Every time that I have a problem about things changing and, and moving on, I always stop myself and say right there, God changed his, mes his method and left the message. I can do the same thing. That's hard, but it's possible. So then there's, there's, there's aids of the, of the message, help for the message, not for the method, for the message. This would be like, for instance, if you know that the Bible is God's word. Now, it's going to be a lot harder to teach to people and to reach people and to tell them about Jesus if they don't believe in the Bible, but you don't have to believe in the Bible to believe in Jesus. So remember that. You, your, your main goal is to get people into trusting and believing in Jesus Christ, not necessarily that they believe the Bible, that that's helpful. It's a big step. But Jesus never said that you actually had to believe that the Bible was his word to be saved. He said Jesus. So keep that in perspective. I know it's really hard to imagine that and, and, and whatnot. And I'm not telling you to stop preaching the Bible. In fact, I'm saying you need to preach the Bible more. But remember that the people that you're preaching the Bible to, they don't have respect for the Bible anymore. They don't believe, the, the culture doesn't really believe wholesale that the Bible is actually a historical book. They believe that it is more a uh, uh, myth, uh, fairy tales. It has no historical value, that kind of stuff. So remember that when you're using it, that's how what they're going to be at. And you can either waste your time trying to prove and argue the Bible, which you cannot make somebody believe something anyways, or you can use your time planting a seed telling about Jesus. Now, Jesus himself showed us which model was better. He didn't waste his time saying, okay, well, the Bible says this and the Bible says he. He, he told stories and parables and all these different stuff, and where, where it was relatable, he would bring up the Bible. Now, you've heard it said this. It really wasn't even in the Bible, though, but you, this is just how you've heard it. This is, this is what I say. And she had to take all that into consideration. So the methods change, but the message doesn't. Are you using the wrong method for your audience? Maybe you need to think about changing it. Are you trying to reach um, the next generation, this generation, the last generation? What, what are you trying to do? Realistically, you're not going to be able to hit everybody. Um, it's very, 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 very odd for older Christians to want to um, reach out to the next generation because you've got multiple issues. You've got the age barrier. You've got the culture barrier. You, I mean, there's just so many, the, the music style barrier, there's just so many different things to overcome. I mean, it's possible, but typically it's not gonna happen. So you have to kind of pick 
who, how you're gonna how you're gonna reach them and and and, and who you're gonna reach. Now, some churches do this by having multiple services, a contemporary service and a, you know, uh, whatever the other one's called. Um, it's, it, you can you can do something like that, but the problem is is you might have rifts that develop develop within your church, and you really have to watch out for you know complaining and backbiting. And that well, it's just it you just kind of have to be on your guard. So we're gonna go ahead and stop there, and we'll continue this in the next video. So. Um, relating to your audience. <laughs>